Yeah. Okay. So. So, Mr. Patachek? Yeah, Patachek. Patachek. We have a, an old tape recorder here, yeah. and then we've got a digital recorder here. Uh, so, one of them should work. Yeah. And then you'll get a copy of this interview. Yeah. Well, yeah. But um, anyway, this Veterans um, History Project interview is being conducted here uh, at the Niles Public Library on May 26th in the year 2009. Uh, my name is Neil O'Shea. I'm a member of the reference staff here, um, and uh, I'm speaking with uh, Mr. Matthew Potacek, uh, and Mr. Potacek was born on September the 25th uh, in 1925, and uh, he lives here uh, in the village of Niles, and uh, he has kindly consented to be uh, interviewed uh, for this project. And we're very appreciative of his coming in today and being so patient because we've had Mr. Patachik on our list of, to be interviewed for quite a while. Yes. And, um, and Mr. Patachik is a, uh, a CBI veteran. And we don't have, we don't, I think we only have one other CBI vet. So it's interesting to try and get, his, get some more stories on a particular sector of the war that's relatively unknown or underappreciated perhaps by yeah. the modern yes, folks. The CBI, we had the doctors there, we had the medics, we had the quartermaster, took all those people to supply me on the front line. In the, uh, so and far away. Yeah. So Mr. Potacek, when did you, uh, when did you enter the service? Uh, that was in 1944, April. April of 44. And uh, were you living in Chicago? North side, south the side? North side. I went to Lane Technical High School. I was 18 when they, I wanted to join at 17, but my mother and father says, no, finish high school. So I finished high school and I went right into the Army. Were you an only child? No, I had uh, uh, younger brothers. And one went into the Coast Guard. One that was deferred because he was working on lenses, the Norman bomb site, the lenses. So they, he was exempt from joining the Army because he was doing uh, military work on lenses, making these bomb sites. So he didn't have to go. Yeah. So where did you live in the city? Uh, Milwaukee, Armitage, and Western. Oh, right. 2440 West Corbin Street. Yeah. Lane Tech, that's a mighty high school, the oh, Indians. I loved Lane Tech. Oh, I played basketball there, football, <laughs> baseball. I really enjoyed high school. Yeah. Beautiful athletic teachers, and uh, all our teachers were just wonderful. Yeah. Really. So you were in pretty good shape then, physically. Oh, I was physically good, yeah. you know. When I went in the Army, I was about 140 pounds. When I got out, I was 95. Whoa, well, we'll have, that'll be interesting <laughs> to hear how you lost the 50 yeah. pounds. Yeah, I lost that because yeah. we didn't eat half, you know. Yeah. We, our air supply, the, the parachutes missed us, so we couldn't get, the Japanese got our food. <laughs> So you, were you afraid the war would be over before you would get into the war? Well, I was hoping the war would end before oh, I You were, there. okay. Yeah, because, uh, you know, my parents, you know, they came from Poland, and uh, my uncle Andrew was killed by the, uh, the Nazis, the SS. He had a farm there, and uh, we, my mother cried, and... Uh, I wanted to join the army right away, you know, and go to Europe, <laughs> but it didn't work that way. And I went to the Pacific, 
like you say, when you join the army, they put you were. were yeah. Were so you, you you wanted to if the war was on, you wanted to go. I wanted to go to Germany. Go to Germany, but if the war was over, that was okay. Yeah, well, I was hoping the war would end, but it lasted, you know, quite yeah. a while. So 1945, you know. Yeah. So you joined the service then in 1944 in, in April. April of 44, mm -hmm. and you had graduated in January. Oh, you could you could graduate mid-year in those yeah. days, right? 1944, I graduated. Yeah. So you got. Uh, so you got drafted then? Yes, but I wanted to, really, I wanted to enlist. <laughs> My mother and father said no. So, uh, I, you know, when you're home, you enlisted your mother and father. So I, uh, I signed up for the draft, and then uh, I was drafted. Pretty quickly, yeah. yeah. Took me right, you know. Yeah. So you didn't worry about what branch of service or Coast Guard or Marines or Navy no, or I said, Army Air Corps? Navy, I'll go, you know. Yeah. I thought I was going to go to Europe because a lot of my friends went to Europe from Lane Tech. And Howard Waddell, you know, I went back to Lane Tech to find out where all my friends were. And I went visit. Howard Waddell was killed in Germany. We graduated together. So some went to Germany and some went to to the CBI. Yeah. So you 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 get inducted downtown somewhere, do you? Uh, I got inducted uh, at the post office. At the post office. Mm -hmm. And then they put you on a the uh, L, and we went to uh, Fort Sheridan. And from Fort Sheridan, uh, we went to Fort Fort Riley, Kansas. Was that by train or bus or truck or? Uh, by train. By train. By train. And was that the first time you were ever away from home? Yeah. The first time. Wow. Never been away. Never. Did you have a hard time adjusting to the uh, to the army? Yeah, it was strange. You know, I wasn't used to that kind yeah. of life. But but you were used to being on sports teams yeah. and having coaches and stuff like yeah. that and teamwork. Uh -huh. uh, I suppose that helped. Or I mean, yeah, it helped. But I adjusted. You know, you miss home. You miss your mother. You miss your brothers. You miss your sisters. But I adjusted. You know. And then when I went overseas, it was even worse. Yeah. Was now you worse. said basic training was pretty tough. Oh yeah, very tough. Yeah, well, you know, forced marches, getting up early in the morning, on the go, on the rifle range, shooting down with the, the planes that they shot up there. We had the 30 caliber machine guns, then we had to, uh, we had the horses, then we had mules, then we had the 30 caliber machine guns, we had to mount them on the mules. And uh, of course, they used those mules. They brought them overseas with us. Really? Yeah. To, to carry all our equipment. Did uh, you had a tough drill sergeant? Did, oh. did you mention in yes, Sergeant Porter? Sergeant Porter. Oh, was he <laughs> tough? He never let you up. Get up. Get walking. You know. <laughs> he says, "Don't straggle. <laughs> get it." <laughs> You know, we had the forced marches. Yeah. I wonder where he was from, Sergeant Porter. Uh, Sergeant Porter was from Texas. Oh, Texas. Yeah, Texas. You, you, you probably met servicemen from all over the country there, did you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and you got along with most types and people? Oh, yeah, from New York, Kentucky, uh, uh, California, uh, Salt Lake City, Utah, because uh, my friend Dick Miller says, Oh, you know, he said, oh, you're from Chicago. You're, I did, I'm Catholic. He's a Mormon. He says, you know what <laughs> He says, the, they, you threw us out of Illinois, you know, the Mormons. Yeah. I, says, Dick, I don't know, my, I wasn't born. My mother and father were in Poland. Yeah. We, we didn't know nothing about religion, you know, that yeah. religion, the Mormons. You know. yeah. And uh, yeah, he says, yeah, you Catholics threw us out. We had a couple years in Salt Lake City, Utah. But we're still good friends to this day. He's still alive. He, him and I spent time in the foxhole 
you know, we became the best of friends to this day. Does he live, live in Utah? And he lives in Utah. He's retired, so he's got two homes. He's got a home in uh, Beaver Dam, uh, Arizona. I've been there. It's beautiful. That's what we went to visit him and his wife. But they, his mother and father had a factory. He was the richest guy in our outfit. You know, they had, they, you know, all the else. The rest of us were <laughs> not, uh, not poor, but uh, we didn't have the money he had. He had, their parents had a lot of money, you know, yeah. nice cars, beautiful home. Then in Kentucky, Clem, <laughs> we called him, <laughs> we went to visit him, but they had dirt floors for their house, you know? Yeah. And they had a well out there, a house. He was the poorest <laughs> of all that. But we all became very close friends. Very, yeah. very close. And you all worked, you all uh, followed Sergeant Porter's commands. Oh, yeah, yeah. We we listened to him. He was strict, but... Yeah. But So, uh, you mentioned you were in a cavalry outfit. On the 124th. 124th cavalry. But you didn't know anything about horses or mules or Never. before then. But I loved horses. You know, when I was a little kid, well, who could afford a horse, you know? I was born in the Depression. Yeah. I was lucky my mother would send me to school. She put cardboard in my shoes because they, they, the the leather wore out. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that's how bad things were. And during the Depression, there were uh, people in the neighborhood committed suicide. You know, I remember Mr. Buckowitz. He lost his job, he lost his house, and he committed suicide. We had those very bad times. You yeah. Know, we did uh, the eating and food and clothing. There was no, no work. Absolutely. So at least in the army you got uh, food and oh, the clothing army, of some the, kind. The army was beautiful. They gave you nice clothes, plenty to eat. The only thing Sergeant Porter was real strict. He made sure you did your bed right. They had it, the corners had to be squared off. You know, his shoes shined. <laughs> oh, very. Oh, he kept you going night, night and day. You know, we were on the go. He, he never let up. You so there was nothing. There wasn't anything in basic training you had a problem with, though. I mean, no, we uh, you handled it. We handled it. And the training or the no, no, he was sharpshooting or the working with the horses yeah, well, or the mules. Everything worked well, out. Well, we were on the range. He yeah, said, you got to hit that the target. He says <laughs> hit the target. <laughs> no, he used to think. You got to use that kick or something. Yeah, I suppose, right? he'd tell me how to hold the rifle. Yeah, you know, I never had. I never had a rifle. Yeah. But he, then he says, after a while, he said, then he nicknamed me Potsy. I got a nickname of Potsy. <laughs> so, in the Army, they called me. In the, when I was overseas, they called me. Then that name stuck. The name follows you, yeah. yeah the nickname, you know, Potsy. Then Sergeant Potsy. In the book, when I was in the post office, somebody said, Potsy. Then that name stuck with me, you know. Yeah, I see. <laughs> yeah, see, I worked in the, then I got home, you know, from the service. Well, I never had a job. Right. Me? So uh, a friend of mine uh, from uh, uh, Walter Slovak, he was a captain, but he was overseas in Germany there. And uh, he told me to get into the post office. So I got a job in the post office. Yeah. And I was real happy there. Did um so when did you realize that they were gonna send you overseas to the Pacific and not Europe and Oh, the Pacific. Uh, when we finished our basic training, we had uh leave. I had to tell my mother and father and my brothers and sisters that uh, I got a I think it was two weeks they gave me. Then I had a report back to Fort Riley, Kansas. I says, I don't know what's going to happen after that. I have no idea. And then we got orders that we're going, we got on the train, we're going to California. So that's a clue. Yeah. So we went to Cal Riverside, California. <coughs> and then uh, <coughs> they gave us all new equipment. 
all the M1 rifles, 45 sidearms, all new boots, everything new, you know, packs, everything. Canteens, he says, this is your equipment, take care of it. Then we, but they wouldn't tell us where we're going, what we're, then they took us to, uh, I remember it was, uh, Los Angeles, and then we got a, a, on the ship, so 5,000 soldiers on that ship. Do you remember the name of the ship? I can't, I think it's in the report. In the report right? that, yeah, you were, Mr. Yeah. Uh, Pachasek was, yeah. was very kind to bring us a, a history yeah. of his unit that was written by this uh, Major, yeah, Major I, I Sadler. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he wrote it all. I, you know, my memory isn't that good anymore, you know. Uh, so we'll add this to the, yeah. the interview and then... Uh, but uh, we can I remember it was a, a troop transport ship. I can't think of the name of it. Uh, but then we... It took us 30 days because the submarines, Japanese submarines were there. And that no smoking, no lights, because at night, if, the sub, if you had a light there, these submarines would sink the ship. So, uh, so was it hard to pass the time on the ship? Oh, we were down in the hole there, four bunks. And uh, four, we were slept on top of each other, four guys, you know, one, two, three, and four. Nobody went crazy, huh, down there? No, no, no. no. It was kind of lonesome. Yeah. No lights, nothing, you know. But at night, and during the day, you were allowed to go on deck a little bit? to go up on the deck. And then uh, when it come to eating, you know, it's 5,000 troops, you, you had to stand in line. But we only ate, uh, I think it was twice a day. Just for breakfast and one a meal in the evening, and that was it. A lot of cards, play cards, or yeah, then we play cards. Yeah, we had a lot of time. The, uh, were the ship, were the horses and the mules? Were they on the ship? No, they had another ship for them. We weren't on that. But they shipped American mules overseas. Yeah, just the troops and the the. Uh, I think the merchant marines brought them over the the uh, mules and the horses. Because then we, it took us quite a few days, weeks, you know. Then we stopped at Melbourne, uh, Australia. So they said we could get off the ship. And then we, we went, uh, we went walking around in, in Melbourne, Australia. Oh, you had to go down it under Australia and around. Yeah. Wow, no wonder it was along, yeah. And then... Down under. We uh, we rented bicycles there. <laughs> we met some girls over there. We went bicycle riding. Well, you know, you're 18 years old. They brought us to their home, you know? And they talked to us, fed us, you know. It was real pleasant in Australia. I said, oh, this is nice, you know? <laughs> And then we had a report back to the ship. And then after that, we got some more supplies, and we head for Bombay, India. And then Bombay was terrible. They said, so, okay, you can go to shore for maybe so many hours, but it was so bad in Bombay. Warm, hot? Hot, a lot of poverty, yeah. nothing. Nothing. People didn't even have food. It was so bad. We said it was better on the ships than it was in Bombay. I never believed, you know, we had the depression in 1929, but it wasn't as bad as Bombay. Yeah. I said, this is terrible, you know. I, these people were skinny, rags and bones in, in, in India. Uh, I, I said, this is too bad, you know. And then they'd be begging, and I had a little money, I, I would give it to them. Yeah. You know, I felt sorry for these people. They had children there, little oh, begging. And, uh, that was horrible. I felt that depressed me to see, yeah. you know, how people lived. I said, so Bombay, 
You're on the west coast of India. Mm -hmm. Did you go by train into... Then we took, we got a, onto a train, I remember. And then, uh, then from there, we engaged the enemy. The Japanese were all the way into India. Yeah, you the, went to the other side, to Calcutta yeah, then or something, mm -hmm. probably. Or I think it was a Sam, when, uh, a Sam India when we uh, engaged the Japanese. A Sam? Yeah. yeah. And then, I remember the Merle Marauders, they called themselves the Merle. We had a repli we were the replacements for them. They were all beat up. They were fighting there first. And we looked at them, you know, we were healthy. They were beat. Oh, I mean, terrible, terrible condition. So this would have been late 44? Yeah, it was in 44. Like November or October? Somewhere around um, there. Let's see, October. Yeah, somewhere. Yeah. I'm losing, I'm losing track of no, the no, time. No, no, yeah. But uh, we were the replacements for them. I mean, they were ragged. Their uniforms, their shoes, everything. We were had all brand new stuff, you know, all nice clothes, everything. Good boots, brand new. Theirs were ragged and tacked. So we were the replacements for them. Then we would engage the Japanese. We fought the Japanese. In Burma or in in, in, this India, in India in India, but we're doing good because we're we're uh, well trained. What was the terrain like there? Oh, rugged! It, it was kind of mountain, jungle, hilly, jungle. Oh, jungle, jungle. And then we went into. But Burma. you hadn't trained for jungle fighting, going? No, you? no, I didn't train. Not no. in Riley, Kansas. Yeah. So uh, then we uh, we. We replaced the Merle Marauders, I remember them. Then we had uh, the mules come in later, and but we were in combat. We pushed forward. Then the, the rest of the fellas, they were loading up the mules with supplies, putting the, uh, the howitzers on there. I think they were the 105, they call them howitzers. That's for backup. And then we engaged the Japanese. We fought the Japanese every day, every day. But we were doing good. We we're pushing them back, back. Then I recall some of the towns. And then we went to Burma. There was Michinaw. There was a big battle there. And then we lost quite a few men there. And. Uh, my Captain Cavill, we lost him. I seen him get shot. He was shot in battle on the field? The, the captain? The Captain Cavill. In fact, there's a picture of him that showing Captain Cavill. And he got killed, and a lot of the other fellas got killed. Machine gun fire, rifle fire, They were artillery. by the Japanese, by the Japanese. The Japanese had, uh, they had the, uh, they had machine guns, and then they had 25 caliber gun, uh, weapons. And they shot a lot of our men, you know. And then we had a very Cap Captain Cavill. We couldn't get to him for a couple of days because we were pinned down. And uh, so, uh, let's see. Then we were stuck. I forget how many days I was in the foxhole there. With Frank Ponderero, Dick Miller. Then we had a split up one man to a foxhole because. The line, we, the whole line. To hold the line because we lost so many men. And uh, I remember looking out the foxhole and seeing all the dead bodies and we tried to get them. But then we, we were fired upon, so we had to go back. So the radio man came there, and uh, so we were saying, we're pinned down. So we called for back with the howitzers, and then the howitzers would send flares ahead. And we say, hey, is he on target? Is he on target? We says, yeah, I think that's where the machine guns are. So they would. I said, send live ammunition. Then, instead of the 
the white flares was like a live ammunition and all of a sudden boom, boom, and they knocked out the machine gun nest there. And then we got out and we pulled out a lot of dead Japs or they were killed, you know, with our M1s. And uh, then um, with dead Captain Cavill and all the rest of them, they were dead and wounded. So uh, the medics, Green was one of the medics, and I got shrapnel right here. On, your, on the bridge of your nose? Yeah, right just here. Oh, inside, yeah. Eye, but, and then I... You were lucky. Yeah, it just blood. So the, I remember Green patched me up, you know, and uh, then I talked to the... Then the lieutenant says, oh, he says, uh, you got your right eye as good because you can still shoot. <laughs> and it's a that, you know. And I said, yeah, you know, it's it's a you know, it was bleeding, but it didn't affect you know this eye. So they patched me up, re patched me up, and uh, so we're doing good then. We this is in Burma. Burma. We're in Burma. And we thought that was in Michinoff, if I could remember the, the place. They were trying to open the Burma Road, too, yeah, or something. Yeah, we were right? opening the Burma Road. Yeah. We were doing good, but we we're, were pushing the Japanese back. And I remember Stillwell, General Stillwell, came up to the front line. He says, you guys are good. You're holding the Japs back, and you're pushing them back. So they could nickname him. Vinegar Cho, <laughs> he would come over in the front line. He was a real good guy, you know. But I don't know who named him Vinegar Cho, but that's the 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 word that got around, you know. And like me, my nickname was Patsy. Because <laughs> they couldn't pronounce the last name too good. And who gave you that nickname? That was in... Uh, uh, that was Captain uh, Cavill. They, you know, he says, Otzi, you know, and he says, because when we lost our sergeant, then he says, you're taking over the squad. You're a sergeant now. You know, you give the orders. I give you the orders, and you give your men the orders, the new ones, the re replacements. I said, okay. So how many men were in your squad? There were about 12, 12. in the squad. Yeah, so we had a, then he says, I want you to take the squad and go up ahead. So I had to take the squad and we went up, we engaged the enemy and then we had to fire back. And then we dig in. That's the way it went from day to day to day. Beat the enemy and then you engage the enemy and then you fight, they kill you, you kill them. That was the way life was. So you must have pushed them back a hundred miles? Or? Yeah, we pushed them back quite a bit. Yeah. And we were fighting and fighting in the rich and all there. Burma. So you had continuous country. days of combat. You yeah, every day we you had. Say a couple of months, three months? or Months. Months, months and months, yeah. yeah. You figure uh, 44 and then when we were fighting there, I remember it was, not, I think it was August, in 1945, they says they dropped the atomic bomb, and that ended the war. So then I remember we had a, a C-46 troop transport plane. They put us on there, and then they flew us into China, and then there were thousands. Japanese, I don't know if you have the picture, thousands of Japanese I could, that we had, we says, I hope they know the war is ended. So uh, the lieutenant says, what are, we, what are we supposed to do with them now, you know? And, and then there was major uh, blur, he said, put them into the racetrack. We had to wind up, get all the Japanese and put them in the racetrack. It's a prison camp. 
Where was that? Do you recall that? That was in around Shanghai, China. Wow, that's a good, that was a long flight from uh, Burma yeah, to Shanghai. Then we flew to, to, we got on the C-46. I remember there was, a, they said Jimmy Stewart was there, the Flying Tigers. Oh, yeah. And we were at the air base. I said, Jimmy Stewart? You know, I knew Jimmy Stewart, but I did, never saw him there. But he was a pilot there, yeah. a Flying Tigers. I said, oh, gee, I'd like to meet him. <laughs> and did you? No, I yeah. couldn't meet yeah. him, no. Yeah. But he was on that base. But, I, but they put us on this cargo plane, C-46, and we flew over the hump to to Shanghai, China. Then we had to take all the weapons away from the Japanese and like the lieutenant says, put them in the racetrack. So well, I says, boy, <laughs> you know, I didn't know what was going on half the time. You know, everything moves so fast, but you just take orders from your commanding officer. Yeah. So then I have to tell the guys in my squad what to do, take the guns away. Yeah. Why do you think they, they made you a sergeant? Because you had leadership ability and well experience or I survived most of the my sergeant was dead, got killed. The corporal got killed. All the guys in my outfit were all the, then I had no replacements. Oh, see, you, yeah. Because my, the guys in our outfit were killed, you know. So then uh, Captain Cavill says, Sergeant, you're a sergeant now, like a battle commission. No, yeah. yes, sir, you're taking over. You know? yeah. I said, okay, Captain Cavill, okay. So I took over. Were the Japanese good fighters? They were good fighters, very good. I remember some of them way up there in the tree, snipers shooting down at you. And uh, then we, uh, we, we were starving, or we ate the Japanese food. We were so hungry. You know, they had food, so we ate their food. Because our airdrop, they missed the airdrop. They didn't know where we were, because, you know, half the time I didn't know where I was. But uh, they got these officers, like uh, Major, boy, he was good, you know, he knew the terrain, he knew exactly what, what command to give everybody. Yeah. So it was continuously fighting. So your parents didn't know how things were going, did no, they? No, I couldn't write. No. They didn't know if I was alive or dead. Then my oldest brother, Wally, uh, he got married while I was in combat, you know. And uh, my, he told my mother that I'm dead because I used to write a postcard every day. And uh, the letters stopped, you know, cards didn't come for a long time. So my brother says, I'm getting, Mary wants me to get married. I know I promised Matt he would be the best man. So uh, they all thought I was dead. They got letters from the war department. Your son is missing. We lost contact from the war department. They didn't know where I was either, you know. No, uh, all the people, all these soldiers dying and uh, and I'm not able to write a letter. How are you going to write? There's no way. Who's going to mail it <laughs> out there in the jungles? You know, in the jungles uh, they had they had these man-eating tigers. We had to kill one of them because uh, they had the kachins and the gurkies. The gurkies, the, the troops. No, these were the natives of Burma these lions would go into their village and kill their... Uh, Man-eating yeah, tigers, yeah. Their, their livestock. Yeah. And then, uh, oh, I remember uh, it was Pace. He saw this big tiger, and he took his M1 and boom, boom. So I saw this big tiger, too, and I started shooting at it. I got scared. 
and then we killed it. It was a big tiger. Oh my God! And then uh, we went to this village there. I think they called Kachins or Gurkis or something. And they had food. We ate their food, but they were so happy that we uh, killed this big tiger. So they were very grateful. And I, uh, I then I, I we got the food, but then I gave them an exchange blanket, an army blanket, you know, for the food, you know. And I saw I, they had chicken there. You know, I ate chicken. <laughs> you, you know, uh, but we're fighting over there. And you meet these natives, you know, but they they were nice, you know. They didn't care for the Japanese. They didn't like all. the Japanese? They didn't like the Japanese. Because well, the Japanese were tough or they something. They were tough. They were mean. mean to them. And we, <clears throat> we would help them. We gave them... <clears throat> Green would give them medical supplies, you know, help them out there and give them blankets. And then we even gave them an M1 rifle to protect themselves from, from the tiger. Tiger. from the tigers. <laughs> I couldn't believe <clears throat> that there was a tiger that big. Yeah. Un unbelievable. From this wall to that wall, bigger than that, you know, the, with the tail. Oh, jeez. I says, <clears throat> I says, the pace, I says, he, 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 he shot him, and then I saw him there, and then I started shooting at him. I was scared, you know, and, uh, but we killed him. Yeah. Was that the only time you were scared while you were over there? I was scared all the time. You were scared all the time. I, every day I was scared. Yeah. Um, when you're in that foxhole, and you got that thin line, mm -hmm. um, do, can you sleep? No, you don't or sleep. You, you sleep half You know what? We had a two-man foxhole. One would look this way and one would look that way. And that's the way we're. One would stay awake while the other one would get some rest, you know. But you're so scared you couldn't sleep, you know. And then uh, you would catnap during the day, you know, to get some sleep because you were scared at night. So what we we did, we put the hand grenades. We'll make a line. A line in case they come at night and trip, and then you the, the, the hand grenade would go off, and uh, then you knew the Japs were there. Then you'd wait, and then you could see in the morning they infiltrate your line. And then these you knew you killed Japanese because they would crawl at night. And then we'd shoot when the the uh, grenade would go off. Then we'd fire in the dark, <laughs> you know, shoot now. Then we'd find dead Japs, maybe five feet, ten feet away from our foxhole. That's the way we lived, day after day after day. So, uh, <clears throat> so you received your bronze star. Was, was that for a particular incident, a battle, the bronze star? Well, I didn't, <laughs> the bronze star, I, I don't know, I received the bronze star. Somebody uh, recommended, recommended the, uh, the bronze, I get the bronze, but I was just doing my, du you know, yeah. duty, you know, where, uh, I tried to do the best I could, you know, uh, the wounded, we had to carry out the wounded. Uh, we saw a lot of them have their legs amputated right there on the spot. They were all the doctors says we got to amputate. Well, we took with we had to take with Green the medics. We took them back to to where the doctors were. You know, was and uh, they were the guys in the outfit were screaming, yelling, but we had to take the wounded back. See. And then the doctors, <clears throat> then the major uh, Blair would say, you got to get back to the front line. Get back to the front line, you know, we'll take over from here. So we left. How did you transport the, them to the back? Was that on a truck down the road, a bumpy road? No, what we did, we put them in blankets or ponchos. And we carried them. And carried them. 
Wow, the best we could. And then how did they, uh, did they have a hard time getting supplies to you when you're... Then they had the supplies, the rare, they, we, half the time they, we didn't get this, we were running low on ammunition too. So we had to uh, go back there and get the ammunition because they didn't bring it up to the front lines, you know, they're supposed to supply us with the, yeah. with the brilliant. Did you mention about uh, parachute drops? Oh yeah, the parachute drops. And then sometimes they'd miss, the, miss us and they'd get into the Japanese hands and <laughs> they got our supplies. So, uh, so we had to watch our ammunition, you know, because uh, we had the 45 caliber and we had the 30 caliber for the M1s but we had to be careful, you know. But then we went, uh, then our supplies, then we went to the rear echelon. We'd send, we'd send some of the guys like Porter or Pace. We said, go and see if we can get some ammunition. You know, we're, we're running low. So they go back there, and sure enough, they had the ammunition there. Then they had to bring it up to the front line. Would that be like 20 miles or? The, uh, well, let's see. They would be behind the lines maybe five miles five or miles, so. Yeah. yeah. About five miles, I would say. Because we had to take all our wounded back there. Because we had the doctors there. Yeah. So when, the, when, when you're pushing the Japanese back, mm -hmm. Do you ever capture any Japanese prisoners, or do they ever capture yeah. any American prisoners? No, uh, they did. We were we buried our dead. They never had any pris our prisoners. We buried the dead because we were winning. We were, maybe we would go five miles or so, and we dig in. We were pushing them back, pushing them back. It was a struggle, you know. This is going on for months. Months, months. There was no days off. You didn't know if it was Sunday or Monday. We lost track the, of time. the time because all you were doing is fighting, fighting, fighting. No rest fighting. and recreation back no, in Calcutta or someplace. No, no, no way. You were there to stay. That's what uh, Captain Cavill said. You're going to be here until the war is over. You're going to be here till the war is over. So we says, well, we get, let's get this war over. We thought we could push them back, win. But we had a lot of casualties, a lot of casualties. And when is it going to end? We don't know. But then, we, I would have, if they hadn't dropped that atomic bomb, I don't think I'd be here today. Because my luck, would have run out because you know how long can you survive you know all those you're months. fucking the odds all the time yeah you know and um, then my my feet were bleeding you know from walking because they're wet and then uh, I didn't dare take my shoes off my clothes off because you never know when you're going to have to be on the move again. So I never changed my shoes, my clothes, and then, uh, no, you know, you didn't even want to bathe, you know, nothing, even if there was a stream there. Well, we'd throw a hand grenade in the stream and catch fish to eat the fish. Blow the fish out of the water. Yeah. Out of the water. That's the way. We ate them raw. And, uh, that's why I was down to 95 pounds. Then when the war, when we went to um, Shanghai, and then they brought all our wounded, you know, the cargo to, to the hospital in Shanghai, the guys from my outfit, I was over there, and then they worked on my eye, you know, and they took a piece of metal out over here, and uh, the doctor, then we had doctors over there. And, uh, and I'm going around with the bedpans, 
helping the guys, you know, they couldn't get out of bed, and uh, helping them, you know, this is after the war. And it seemed then, I remember Albert Wiedemeyer was there, and he looked at me, he said, Soldier, I've been watching you. You're going around here doing this and that. I said, yeah, he said, uh, the men from my outfit. And he says, uh, he went like this, you're pretty skinny. He says, I want you to be my bodyguard, you know, my chauffeur. I says, okay. So they, <laughs> I rode a jeep and around Shanghai there. And meanwhile, the were getting uh, the Red Cross ship came in in uh, Shanghai, and then uh, they're re replacing me because I'm I was like a nurse then with in the hospital. So was Wiedemeyer a colonel or a general? A or general. A general. Albert Wiedemeyer. I didn't. Get, I could. I didn't know when it came to rank. I did like Stillwell. He was just like a GI. <laughs> you know yeah. I mean, we knew he was the general, though. Yeah. And everybody was down to earth, you yeah. know. And so I was chauffeuring General Wittemar. Then we had to go up to uh, Manchuria to get the prisoners, you know, uh, the pilots out. Uh, you know, you're always busy doing something. So uh, we sh showed the, pr the, jet, uh, the uh, American pilots. We, they, we got them out of prison, and then they were bringing, they brought in uh, these ambulance, Red Cross ambulance, to take all these guys, their prisoners, um, American prisoners, their pilots, their skin and bones. And uh, I remember we were saying, oh my God, how, how could they miss, you know what I mean, they really treated them. They executed a lot of the pilots that took those Japanese swords, you know, behead them and behead them. And they told these prisoners they're going to all die because we are going to rule the world. The Japanese told the American prisoners, the pilots. These were mostly all pilots there. And uh, I, I couldn't believe that they would mistreat we. Yeah, we took Japanese prisoners, but we never mistreated them, you know. We fed them, so if they needed medical attention, they got it. But uh, they didn't treat our prisoners good at all. So uh, then all this time, you know, <laughs> I mean, uh, there's so many things I've been doing all the time. Yeah. I don't know where the time went. Uh, but then, uh, so you so you had gone in in April of '44, and you come out in May of '46. And so even though the war ends in I think August of '45, yeah, but there's you're still doing all this cleanup or yeah, whatever in, in China. A yeah, a lot of things that there's a lot of work to be done. You know, it's uh, we, there's uh, the sick, the wounded, uh, so many things and. Uh, and then we had to make sure everything was taken care of. All our war dead, we had to go back and dig them up. The ones that died, they got killed. We had to make sure the grave registrations, because I said, what well, the bodies, you know, we buried them. So we had to go back. You went back to Burma? To Burma. And they had a detail. I told them where these bodies were, you know, and we dug them up. Uh, Did you say that Captain Cavill was killed? Captain Cavill was killed. In Burma? In, in Burma. Yeah, I remember him getting killed, you know, and I remember all the dead bodies. They all blew up, you know, oh, and the smell, you know, for days because we couldn't get at them. We were pinned down. And then somehow, we still well got uh, replacements for us. We needed, you know, we're outnumbered. So they got new, new blood coming, replacements. 
And then when we got enough of manpower, then we push forward. Push forward. But not enough manpower to put in a new regiment and pull you guys out. You guys no, thought were there. No, we had to be. Because it sounds like you were. No. You had a plenty of combat points. Yeah. Your time in a in a war zone. Yeah. Yeah. Because they, we were short of men. Short of men. You know. And here I am. I had this patch on my eye, and I had a piece of shrapnel in this finger, and I. You know, when I went to the doctor, and uh, Dr. Damsky, this picture blew up, and he says, how did that happen? I says, oh, maybe 60 years, there's a piece of metal still in here. From the war? Finger, from the war. Wow. And I went to Resurrection Hospital, then I went to another doctor, surgeon, and then they says that. Everybody is saying, how long ago was that in there? I said, 60 some years, a piece of metal. Quite a souvenir. Yeah, and then uh, nobody wanted to take it out. Yeah. So they, they put a mill, uh, needle here, a needle here, and a needle here. They threw all that pus out. Yeah. That's the middle finger on it's your right leg. Here. Yeah. Yeah. And that's your right, that's your trigger no, finger. No, no, no. No. <laughs> the right here. Uh, Take all the shaft on the left uh, side, you can still work with that. Yeah, because uh, the National Service officer, you know, when he looked my record up, you know, he says, he says, oh yeah, they got you, you know, and uh, you got, before you got discharged, you know, they gave me glasses because I had 20, 80 in this side, 20, 20 in this side. When I went in the service, I had 20-20 in both eyes. So the 20-80 was probably a result of this that. This is a, from the that shrapnel. piece of metal that was yeah. in the shrapnel. It hit right in the corner here. That shrapnel came, comes from a, a, a shell or a bomb or a... Well, I, I don't know. It could have been from a hand grenade. You know, uh, when you throw hand grenades, you know, or somebody throws, and if they throw, don't throw it far enough, piece of that metal could hit you, see, and then metal here, the one we're engaged with the Japanese, they're throwing grenades at us. Do their grenades look like American grenades? No, they're all together different. Uh, Are they long, like a long, long, no. Yeah. Long, like a banana or something. Yeah. 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 So, uh, then you s all this stuff flying all over, and, and then I got it here, and then the figure, and uh, but what the, 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 this was minor. I don't call that a minor. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I didn't, but when the guys get their legs blown, you know that's bad. You know yeah. when they amputate an arm or a leg, that was the, it's the sad part. Yeah. And uh, but the food got a little better when you got to Shanghai, or oh, when I got to I ate with the general Widemeyer. I ate with Chiang Kai Shek. Wow, General. There's a new book out on Chiang Kai Shek. Yeah, yeah, I ate with him, talked with him, talked to his wife. Wow, Madam Chiang Kai Shek, she was quite yeah. a, a person too. Yeah, and they, they even gave me a medal. I don't know what happened to that medal. I says, I told my sister, I says, you know, I came home with the, you know, a medal, you know, from there that Chiang Kai Shek gave me, you know, because. Uh, Chinese combat command, you know. So, uh, but he was nice. Chiang Kai Shek was nice. Then later, I was, uh, he says uh, to Chiang Kai Shek, we got a problem. He says the communists yeah. are taking over. So, we had to take Chiang Kai Shek, his wife, and all. His people got him on one of our troop ships, and then we went to uh, Formosa. I think they call it Taiwan. Right. Now. Yeah. Yeah. So we went there. We so you were in on that. So we. Wow. Had, yeah. So uh, we went to F Formosa with Chiang Kai Shek, married everybody. Then we came back to Shanghai. Uh, with, you know, we escorted them there. And then I, I says, when I, then I, the General Littlemeyer says, well, it's time for you to go home. 
I remember him saying that. So he says, you're going home. Our work is done. So I got on the ship with the rest of the fellas and they sent us home. So you sailed from Shanghai or something? Shanghai. Like to San Diego or San Francisco? We went back to California. Yeah. Los Angeles. Los Angeles. The Golden Gate Bridge, you yeah. know, and uh, we saw that, Alcatraz, and, and then they put, then they stripped us, gave us a good physical, all combined, the doctors, they checked us over, made reports, did this, burned all our clothes, <laughs> and then they kept us in isolation for I don't know how long. They fed us good, then they gave us, then we showered, cleaned, put on clean, all new clothes <laughs> before they released us. Then they sent me, oh, what? No, that was, but I got this Fort Sheridan. I got this charge, I think it was Fort. Oh, you know what? I can't think of this place in Illinois. Randall or uh, Rockford or? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. See my memory. Grant. It was uh, like Fort Sheridan. Yeah. So they kept us there. And we got our discharge. Then they gave us cash, so much money. And uh, then I got back. From there we got discharged and we were on our own. We took the train back to Chicago. And uh, then I came home and I surprised my parents. <laughs> then my mother checked my arms, <laughs> my legs. She thought I was, you know, uh, missing a leg or an arm. I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm okay, I'm okay. So had you been able to send him a postcard from Shanghai or anything? Or? Yeah, I did, yeah. Mm -hmm. Then I did, you know. I wrote the letters and cards, you know. And uh, I said, I don't know when I'm coming home though. I didn't know, nobody knew, you know. But, uh, what's it, I mean, Thinking, thinking, thinking of all, you know, this is going back quite a few yeah. years. Were there, were there chaplains in the, on, the, on the front? Do you have any chaplains or religious support, in a sense, while you were in battling in Burma? No, no, it was no all, chaplains. You were way out there, yeah. No, no, yeah. no nothing. I, I didn't even know if it was Saturday or Sunday. Yeah. To me, every day was a day, you know, combat day. Yeah. Yeah, so... Uh, well, did you, did it, was it hard to adjust to civilian life when you made it home for a while? It was. It was. I belonged, I joined the VFW, you know, the guys, you know, Joe Slovak, uh, he was a captain in uh, Germany there, you know, I fought in Normandy, Germany, you know, and he, and he, he was in the post office before he went into the war, and uh, he talked to me at the, one of the meetings, and he says, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know what I want to do, you know? I says, I'm lost, you know? I, I says, I had training at Lane Tech. I was working at 16, I got Social Security card, you know, I worked in the machine shop making the floor equipment. You know, I ran a lathe and milling machine and things like that. For doing work for the uh, for the for the navy, you know, for doing this, Mr. Schwartz says it's all uh, uh, military that we're working for. So uh, from 16 to eight, I worked two years in the machine shop. So I says I don't know if I can go back to the machine shop, you know, and uh, so he says, why don't you try the post office? So I went in the post office, you know, and I says, boy, all these letters, you know, and then there's 80 carriers at Lakeview, and then John Roman, the superintendent, says, he, he says, uh, here's a scheme sheet. There's 80 carriers, and then I had to memorize it. 
I pick up a letter, I look at the scheme sheet, all goes to carrier number seven. Then I look at the scheme sheet, I pick up another letter. I had to memorize all this, but that was good for me. Yeah. I, it took my mind off of, of uh, the past. Yeah. I had something to learn. I'm learning the scheme, the Lakeview scheme. That's from the Versi to Montrose, Lakeshore to Damon, all in that area. I said, this is different, you know, it's good for me. I'm thinking about the letters, took my mind off the war. So I'm sorting this mail out, learning the scheme. Then I go out and I'm carrying the mail. Then, then he says, uh, uh, we got a, a mail for collections, for collections. Then I'm on collections, parcel post. I had an army truck. He says, he says, oh wait, you can't drive an army truck. You got to have a license. I said, I got a license from the army. He gave me a license in the night. So he says, good, take the truck out, deliver parcel post. I'm on, Lake, I'm on uh, Lakeshore Drive. You're doing everything. Yeah, I'm doing everything. I was a clerk carrier. Oh, I loved it. I says, I, I work the window. I sell stamps. I weigh packages. I says, oh, this is nice. I loved it. You know, it took my mind off, off, off the war. And uh, they, I could work eight hours, nine hours, ten hours. They, they sure, it's always short. They needed help. They needed help. You know, be, so I, I got paid. I said, boy, they pay you. And when I'm in the army, I didn't get paid for all the extra work. Yeah. I said, this is nice. I'm making money, you know. And uh, I said, this is very good. And uh, well, then, when, like in the army, you got $50 <laughs> a month, you know. But when I was overseas, they didn't pay me. There's nobody to pay you. So I got a, a, you know, in the army, they gave me a lump sum. They figured, oh, they just finance, financial officer, trying to figure out how, what my pay would. Because he says, you're going to get paid overseas pay. You're going to get combat infantry pay. You're going to get sergeant's pay. This guy was figuring this all out. And then, I says, well, whatever it is, you know, how many days were you there? You know, this and that. So he figured out I got close to $3,000. That was year. money. Yeah, that's three thousand. I love some. So uh, I put that in the bank, you know, the $3,000. I says, oh, this is nice, you know. I'll, I'll be able to buy clothes and jackets. <laughs> And then I, then I said, well, the income tax. He says, no, you don't pay no income tax on this. Truman gave an order, you're exempt from income tax. I said, oh, because when I was working at 16, I paid income tax. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Social Security and all that. He says, no, this is all yours. So they gave me a check for a lump sum. Then I get into the post office and I'm making money there. I says, oh my God, I'm, I'm really well off here, yeah. you know. I'm doing good. Then they give me the uniform allowance, you know. <laughs> they paid for my uniform too. I said, well, I got a free uniform in the Army, free uniform yeah. in the post office. <laughs> so how many years did you work for the post office? Forty-three years. Forty-three years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all in Lakeview? All in Lakeview. Boy, you must know Lakeview pretty I well. Know it. They, I know everybody, everybody in, in there. I delivered every block in Lakeview. When I retired, they gave me the biggest party, the people in the, where I delivered the ma mail. Big, beautiful party. The post office gave me a big party, you know? I says, oh my, I didn't want to retire. But my wife was sick, very sick. You know, she needed care. She said, Matt, this is it. I know you love your job. But I need you. 
but I need you at home. Yeah. You know, she had, she diabetic, bad, she had uh, two uh, open heart surgeries, the ortho valve and the mitral valve. So she was very, very sick. Had you met, you met your wife after the war? Uh, I knew her before the war. We were, we went to school together. Uh, to grammar school together? To grammar school. What grammar school was then? J school. J school. Yeah, but uh, she she was in Tooley High School. I went to Lane Tech. Because Lane Tech was all boys at yeah, that time. Yeah, all boys. But we were neighbors, you know. Was she a Polish, Polish Polish background? Girl. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I knew her all my life. And then, so she saw you in a uniform then? Or? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, uh, we so she must have been worried about you too. Like oh, you yeah. Away. Yeah. And then I didn't want to get married right away, you know. I says, because, uh, I says, you know, you, you want to at least get settled down. Yeah. You know, and I was ready for a marriage. And, uh, but then later in life, well, she waited for, we went out all the time, but I didn't want to get really married, you know. I says, you know, let me uh, settle down here. Yeah. You know, because then you, you get married, you got to pay, you got to get your own place. Your yeah. own place. Then you got a, a wife to support and everything. And uh, then too, and even when we moved out the Niles, you know, there's a mortgage and everything. Yeah. So when did you get married, if I may ask? Uh, I was 31 years old when I got married. That was 1956? Somewhere around there. Yeah. And then did you move to Niles then? Then we moved to Niles. Her girlfriend lived out here. And she says, Jeannie, there's a nice house for sale. So we came out and looked at it. She loved it. She gave, we gave a handshake, we're going to buy it. Just with a handshake. And uh, so then the, I had a little money saved because I didn't want to get married and not have money, sure. you know, because it, it just don't work Isn't out. Right. Yeah. So uh, I went and got a mortgage and uh, Mr. Gorsky gave me the mortgage on the house and the house was 22000 I can recall 22000 for the house. And, uh, Jeannie says, I love it, I love it. So I says, okay, we're going to buy it. So I had a little money saved for a down payment and the rest was the mortgage. That took you longer to get to work then. Yeah, huh? 10 miles. Yeah. But, uh, but I worked a lot of overtime, the post office, overtime. Oh, we doubled the payments. So that hey, everything's beautiful now. Now the whole world is opening up. I'm really living. Oh, God, I says, this is the life, you know? Yeah. Nice wife. Good job. Well, I'd say you had it coming. Oh, you my earned God. It. You earned it. I says, I can't believe it, you yeah. know? I says, you walk in the streets, nobody's shooting at you. <laughs> it's, you stop at a restaurant, you have your coffee, you want a sandwich, you have a sandwich. <laughs> I said, this is, this is, this is living, you yeah. know. I really enjoyed, uh, after the war, it was, uh, I, I, was, I was lucky, but there are, a lot of my friends lost, like West Brown, he lost both legs. And uh, we, were, we were helping him out to get around, pick him up, take him here. To another uh, friend of ours, where they were carpenters, and they made a ramp going into his house. Uh, General Motors gave him an Oldsmobile with the steering wheel, with the brakes and the gas up by the steering wheel. So he was became independent. He said, I don't need you guys. <laughs> The chauffeur be around. I got a car. I says, okay, Wes. And uh, then he went to Brad. He says, see these brand new shoes. You know, he said. That's funny. <laughs> he said, not too hard. Just a leg. He's got real shoes. And, yeah. 
So we, we had these meetings, you know, we get together. The VFW or the? That was, uh, we called ourselves Chicago Veterans of Overseas. The CVO West, or something. He, yeah. he uh, Wes was the uh, commanding officer. And uh, the NASMICs were the secretary. And we did the neighborhood group. Did Wes hurt lose his limbs in Europe or Asia? Or? Uh, in the, he lost his. He was in the C, CBI too. Oh, what you see? Yeah. yeah. I, but not in your unit. Not in my yeah, unit. Yeah. And he lost his legs over there. And uh, well, we had a lot of guys in our outfit, you know, uh, lost their limbs. And then I belonged to the American Legion, Franklin Delano Roosevelt Post. I belonged to all these different posts, you know, here, there, you know. And uh, then my wife would say, you know, I don't mind you going out. She says, but be careful with drinking, you know, yeah. when you're with the, the drink. She says, I don't want you drinking, because my wife didn't drink. She did not drink. So I used to be very careful. I said, I if I had a beer, I'd, I'd sip it. I wouldn't no more than one beer. Yeah. You know, she said, I don't want you getting drunk now. Don't get drunk. I said, okay. So a lot of times I go out, I would just drink ginger ale. Yeah. You know, or seven up or something like that. Yeah. Because my wife didn't want me drinking, yeah. you know, because you can get carried away with drinking. Yeah. So, but I says, okay, I'll li want to listen to you. Yeah. yeah, I had a beautiful wife, you know. Uh, I, I even got a picture of her here. She so she was out of this world. Oh yeah, just I that the best thing of my life. When I married her. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that was Jeannie. Jeannie. Yeah. yeah. I'm telling you, she was number one. Number one. But she had problems. We had one boy, uh, Paul, in our marriage. And beautiful baby. But what happened to, to, to premature. The lungs were not the developed. Yeah. And... Uh, so uh, it was in, in the incubator, it was in the, the hospital, and uh, we would, well, I, when I went to see him, he would uh, cry the lungs. I said, he's got good lungs, then, if he can cry like that. Yeah. But the lungs were not developed. Three months later, later he passed away. So we, uh, we buried uh, little Paul at the foot of my mother and father's grave. Because Ben Malik and uh, Monica Malik, Monica Malik is my cousin. She married the undertaker, Ben Malik, in Chicago. So uh, I went to, to see Monica and Ben, and they says, they got the call. I says, you handled it. So they picked the baby up, they put the baby in the coffin, but he says, this is a private, it would be a private wake, you know. Yeah. And uh, they handled everything. And uh, I talked to my wife, you know, what should we do? Well, we had the baby girl, Alice, and everything before he died. Because my wife was very religious, yeah. good Catholic, yeah. very good. And uh, she's, says, well, okay, have baby Paul buried at the foot of my mother and father's grave. Yeah. So, so were you in St. John Bray Book Parish yes, here? St. John, no, what, this happened in Chicago. In Chicago, yeah. this is before you moved out here. Yeah, yeah, because I was married at, in St. Sylvester Church over there. But then I had to go to pre Canada. And then I had confessions, and then I told the priest, maybe you won't marry me. And he says, why? Well, I'm not here to confess. I killed people, Japanese. I, you know, he 
he says, oh my God. And uh, he said, how many Japanese did you kill? And I said, I don't remember. I didn't, I really don't, you know, I never kept count. I told him, I don't know, a lot of them. And I said, you won't, I told him, you probably won't marry us in church because I'm considered a murderer. He says, no, you're going to get married in church. And I says, yeah. He says, you were fighting the evil empire. You were doing God's work. Oh, my God, that made me feel good. Yeah. <laughs> I says, oh, I, you know, I told him the truth, you know. Yeah. And I even told Jeannie, you know, uh, I never told her about the war. I never yeah. discussed that with the war with her, you know. And I said, the priest gave me the okay. <laughs> what was his name, Father? Uh, Father Lass. Father Lass. Yeah, Father Lass. Young, young priest, you know, nice guy. Yeah. Was a, you know, maybe if I would have, I had a young, he was real compassionate, very understanding, you know. Yeah. And uh, then later, then that, you know, then, uh, well, <laughs> you know, I, I drank, you know, I drank a little beer, you know, he smelled it hot. He said, you've been drinking. I says, oh yeah, I had a beer, you know. And uh, he says, you know, I'd like to have a beer too, you know. So <laughs> so he brings out a bottle of beer and we're sitting there and drinking and we're talking about you know, the old days and everything. And I said, oh boy, I, I'm glad I'm getting married by you. You're a real good priest. <laughs> Your father lasts real good. You know, that was pre canon that was it. They're telling you about Mary, you know, yeah. it's it's not an easy life to, to get married, you know. They're warning, you see. And uh, then you make your confessions and all that, you know. I still do. I go to St. John and confess. You know, if I do something wrong, yeah. I confess, you know. But I don't try to do anything. I, I try to be good, yeah. you know. Well, it sounds like you didn't do anything wrong while you were in the Army. Yeah, well, no. it didn't bother me, though. You you know, try, oh, of course. Oh, you yeah. know, the killing. Oh, you know? yeah, we well, could. I, it's either to kill or be killed. Yeah. And if I didn't kill, they would kill my, the people in the back lines, there's the doctors, there's the medics, they, they would kill them all. They, they, were, they had no mercy. Like the, when I belonged to the, uh, the disabled American veterans, you know, I joined that club too. They were telling me about that Bataan March, oh. you know, these, how they killed these guys that couldn't walk anymore. They, just push them on the side of the road and kill them or bane at them. You know, horror stories that the Japanese did. People don't realize how mean they were. The Americans were never that way. You know, if we took a prisoner, we treated them good. We fed them. We didn't abuse them. We weren't brought up that way. Yeah. See? But uh, when you listen to the stories from all these other veterans, they're, the Japanese were good people. No, no. At least Americans have compassion. When we took prisoners of war, we took care of them. They worked in our camps, you know, like the uh, pr uh, p uh, prisoners of war from Germany in Fort Riley, Kansas, when I was there. They had prisoners of war there, but they treated them good. They worked in the kitchens. They served the food. But we never abused it, the yeah. German soldiers. Yeah. You know. Mr. Podacek, did you, did you ever consider making a career in the Army? No, I don't think. I, I would, I really wasn't cut out to be an Army man, you know combat especially, you know, it's not, it's not in me yeah. to, to, to make, but if we were at war, 
I would go. Yeah. I would, you know what I mean? If they were going to come here and take over our country, then I would go to, to defend my country. But to make a career out of it, you know, um, I don't. I I love the post office. <laughs> That's the career. I enjoyed the people. Enjoyed talking to the people, delivering their mail. You know, mm -hmm. it was just. Did you join the reserves though? When you yeah, came? I joined the the national the uh, national guard. National guards. Yeah. So how long were you as part of that? Job? I was in there. Uh, so I was in there for, I think, a year, and then uh, then my boss says, you know what, we need you here. You, you know, uh, I was working long hours, and he says, you, you're needed more here. So then uh, I talked to the lieutenant, I says, I says, uh, can I, this, this is peacetime yet. I said, you know, I'm working long hours at the post office, you know, then to be involved here. So I talked to the lieutenant, and uh, he says, well, we'll give you a discharge, you know. You know, th this is peacetime now. Yeah. But I figured I still wanted to be, join the National Guard in case they needed me, you know. I'd go back in to defend this country, you know, because that... I love this country, you know. If anybody attacked this country, it didn't, I would be the first one to go. So the, my uh, superintendent, uh, Mr. Roman from Lakeview, says, you know, you, you're you working seven days a week here because you're, uh, I know, we, because we need you. I was working Sundays, too. And uh, he says, you, it's too much for you to do this and do that. So uh, I got a discharge. You know, the lieutenant says, no problem, Let's give you a discharge. So if you were in the National Guard, would there have been a possibility that you would have been called up during Korea? Or? If I was in the National Guard and the Korean War broke out in 1950 or 51, yeah, 50, yeah. Uh, I would have been in Korea. They would have activated me and I would have went there. But then I was discharged before that. Yeah. And then uh, working in the post office, it's federal work. I would, I would be, I'm exempt because I'm already doing federal work. So they didn't uh, recall me. Yeah. But if they would have recalled me, I'd have to go. Yeah. Um, the last part of the interview, and we ask all the veterans this these couple of questions. Uh, Mr. Podacek, how do you think your military service your military service and your experiences in the Army affected your life? Well, thank God I, I pray every day. I go to church and uh, I'm the horror stories, there's horrors, you know, I dream about it. Oh. And it bothers me. It really does. But when to get away from the past, I like to be kept busy. I like to be working, doing things to get my mind off of the war. I, I don't like to think about the war. Yeah. But I mean, it's still there. You know? Yeah. But keeping busy helps to keep but it at bay. Keeping yeah. busy is the best thing in the world that I, I can do. I do so many things. I help out here. I babysit. <laughs> Just here's a, my extended family, my neighbors. Oh yeah, she's a school teacher. He's a state trooper. I watch these kids. I'm there every day. Are you are you there? Do you there at a certain time today? Yeah. Well, now they got someone there. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the, I always have. Uh, You're off duty today. Yeah. <laughs> I have a replacement there that takes over my job. You know, when I'm ever going to do something, I always tell them because I'm there every day. I watch the kids, you know, yeah. because the mother and fathers don't work. Yeah. So uh, we got the neighbors. In between, I take, I keep occupied. I take some of the neighbors to doctors. 
I, you know, I try to keep yeah. busy doing things for others. Yeah. Keep busy around the house, you know. I, there's not enough hours in the day, it seems. To get it all done, yeah. To get it all done. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Potichek, your military experience, how do you think it affected your thinking about war or about the military in general? I think I hate wars. I wish people could get together and talk instead of going to war. Yeah. Why can't we sit down and straighten this all out? Why do we, if, a, if, if someone in the, if, if the country needs something, if they're, they figure they have to have food, why can't we give them the food? Yeah. You know, provide for them. Why, have, why do we have to have wars? We can help one another. You know, the people over there are starving, send the food there, you know. Like I make commitments you know, to different charity organizations to send that money there to help feed and clothe these children, you know. We, that's what we should do. We should help one another instead of fighting among one another. Yeah. I don't know why the Japanese wanted to attack us in Pearl Harbor, you know what I mean? Uh, there was no reason for it, you know. Uh, would. And now, the Japanese, they build their cars, <laughs> we're buying their cars. See, it's better that we live with one another, and let them build their cars, and sell their cars, and make, and they're doing good. Yeah. Why would they have to go to war? You yeah. know what? They they struck Pearl Harbor. That wasn't right. You no, know, we, we gotta learn to get along with one another. You know, yeah. like uh, our, I get along with different nationalities. Feel good. I got friends that are Italian, friends that are Mexicans, friends that are colored, black. I get along with them all. I says, why can't we get along? Why do we have to kill each other? Yeah. You know, let's sit down. Hey, this is a big world. Let's help one another. Yeah. That's the way I look at it. Those are wonderful. That's uh. Yeah, those are wonderful sentiments. Uh, yeah. Uh, and we had Japanese in our army as interpreters too. You know, Japanese. Yeah. I get along real well with them, you know, the Japanese, you yeah. know, and uh, we, we, thank God we have different nationalities. Uh, I could, when I was, when I was going up to uh, Manchuria to get the prisoners out, we got lost. Wrong, <laughs> wrong way carrying, they called me. So I went into the Russian zone. I stopped, we were stopped by the Russians, and uh, they were speaking Russian, and I was brought up Polish. You know, I was mother and father, but I knew the Lord's Prayer in Polish before I knew it in English. Mm -hmm. And I picked up Russian and Polish. We could communicate with the Russians. So uh, they says, we know where the prisoners are. These are all young soldiers like us. And they says, but stay here because it's getting late, go get up early in the morning and I'll take you to where this, the prisoners are. They already knew. So uh, we're sitting there, they're whining and dying, we're drinking vodka. <laughs> oh. oh my, and uh, we all had big heads the next day with the vodka. And then, he, but these Russians, they, they didn't bother. They could handle it. They handled it. Yeah. So then they showed us where all those prisoners were down there. <laughs> and uh, so then we went down there, and, and uh, the, the lieutenant says, I hope they know the war is over, you know? But we had to be careful. We had to take our weapons with us. And we went in gradually. So I took the 
of the uh, jeep, and I went in first, you know, American flag, because if they're going to shoot, let them shoot me, you know. Don't bring the whole outfit in there. But I went in there, and then we had a Jap American Japanese with me. He could sp speak their language, and they knew the war was over, you know, they surrendered. So we went in there and we got all our prisoners of war out. And, uh, but thank God we had um, Japanese American soldiers, you know, interpreters. They were good. As a matter of fact, uh, when I was in the post office, we had Japanese there too that were. Yeah, there's a Jap Japanese community in Chicago on yeah. the other side, right? Yeah. yeah. So uh, we we had good Japanese. But I didn't like the idea they had turned their mothers and fathers, yeah. but they drafted their sons yeah. into the service. That was, well, they had, uh, they weren't sure, you know. Yeah, yeah. Did, um, so how many of those pilots did you pick up that time in Manchuria? A couple, oh, 300 or? There were, I'd say 160 of them. 160. Pilots that were shot, you know, there were quite a few that were shot down there. Yeah. And uh, they were skin and bones. Skin mm -hmm. and bones. And then uh, what happened, they had a trial. I was at the trial, a military trial, and I witnessed it. And I witnessed the hanging. They were all found guilty. These were Japanese officers? Oh, just the officers that were in charge of the, the camp. They executed our soldiers. Maybe if they would have mis just mistreated them and didn't feed them, maybe they wouldn't have been ex uh, executed. They hung all the officers. I witnessed it in Shanghai there. They had the rope around their neck, the trap door, and they, they were executed by hanging. Yeah, but they should have never killed them. You know, but they killed a lot of the pilots. They were all skin and bones, every one of them. I don't know even know if, if they would, how long they, you know, they had TV and everything. They were. You 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 never came down with malaria or anything or. Uh, uh they gave me. The doctor over there, quinine and adabrine for malaria. They thought I had a touch of malaria, so I was on these pills. I don't know, it was adabrine or quinine yeah. that they were giving me. I had to take. And uh, because a lot of the guys did get malaria. Yeah. From those mosquitoes. Yeah. But uh, sometimes even I would get hot and cold, and hot and cold. And uh, the, the, the medic there talked to one of the doctors, and then they put me, I, I don't remember whether it was quinine or adipine, one of something that yeah. I had to take every day. But uh, Ill effects, I don't know, like I, my doctor, when I went, I've been going to the doctor, they give me pills for uh, potassium pills, they give me pills for the heart, <laughs> they give me pills for thyroid. You look terrific. Yeah, <laughs> so I've taken maybe seven pills. <laughs> Yeah, and then when I went to the, to the hospital, they uh, they gave me pills there, and then they says, "Well, you can get take free glasses. I get free glasses, <laughs> but I will not take money." And all I says to the national service officer, "No, for uh, this." I says, "No, if I'm able to work." I'm doing good. If you want to give me free, a uh, free glasses, okay. <laughs> you know, but I still I wear glasses uh, 
if I drive, yeah. I have the glasses in the car, because then that, because it is I, and then I have the, I wear the glasses. But other than that, if I close this eye, I can see beautiful, you know. And then if I close this eye, everything is blurry. Yeah. And that's from the time you got the yeah, the shrapnel. The shrap, yeah. yeah. Well, I'll have that. That's permanent. He says. Yeah. So, Mr. Potacek, is there anything else you would like to add that we may we haven't covered? Perhaps does anything else come to mind? Or let me see. You you have a remarkable memory. It's yeah. very very good. There's All these names yeah, and sometimes, places and details. Sometimes I, I you know. I, I have a good, I had a sharp memory, I remember, because when I worked in the, in the post, post office, I could remember names. Yeah. And sorting letter, one to 80, you know, when you got, you pick up a letter, and it's in uh, Lakeview, and it's between Lakeshore Drive and yeah. Damon and Diversity, North to Montrose. I can pick up that letter. I tell you exactly where it goes. Yeah, that's the memory, you know. But I want to use the memory, you know, to, to memorize things. Yeah. I, like uh, when we had, uh, oh, I should tell you a story. When I was in Port Riley, Kansas, on the bivouac, and it was a Sunday. They says a day of rest, bivouac. So. There's six of us. We said, let's go to town. I said, I want to go to church because I always went to church. So we saddled up the horses. We're on a bivouac out in the outskirts there. And uh, so we, I'm looking for a church. I don't know about the other guy. One guy's name, last name was Lucky. The other guy, <laughs> we're six of us, and there's Pottero, and uh, then there was Pace, you know, and well, like Pottero is looking for a place to drink, you know, Sunday, you know. I said, I'm looking for a church, you know, I, I'd love to go to church. I still love going to St. John's. And uh, we got stopped by MPs with our horses. We're eight, you know, 18 years old, you know. We thought, oh, it's our, our day off, so we ride to town. And that was in Johnson City. And the MPs catch us. He says, what are you guys doing in town on horses? You know. He says, well, it's Sunday. And uh, I'm looking for a church, and these guys want to go and get a good restaurant, you know. And they, the, the two MPs says, what is your name, soldier? So he asks this one, his name, he says, Lucky. That was his last name, Lucky. He says, the MP says, don't get smart with me, soldier. <laughs> Lucky. <laughs> he says, that's, he showed him the dog tags. <laughs> but I remember him, because that's an unusual name, Lucky, you know. So he says, you guys, we, we're going to write you up. You're, you're, I don't think you're supposed to be here with your horses. <laughs> and uh, so they wrote us up, and we went back to camp, and then we get back to Fort Riley, and guess who my, one of my commanding officers is a captain? Uh, they, um, uh, Dan Daly. Oh, the movie, or the t entertainment. The Jack. entertainer, yeah. Dan Daly is the commanding officer there. And he has this line up in the office there. What do you guys think you're doing? This is a time of war. You know? Well, when you're 18 years old, you don't think, you know, time of war. You know? He says, you guys could be court-martialed for doing this. He says, but I'm going to tell you what. I'll, I'll eliminate the court martial, but you will you accept my troop punishment? We said, okay, Captain Daly, we'll take the troop punishment. You know, we don't want a court martial. 
So he says, okay, you're going to work in the kitchen. And then he says, you're, you're going to put up hurdles for the horses. You know, when he entertains the general there in Fort Riley, Kansas, you know, all these big shots. So he says, okay. So we, we accept the troop, we accept it. So uh, here we are, we, he's got a convertible car, beautiful car, we all get <laughs> six of us <laughs> riding in this car. We're going to the stables, to, and we're, the, all the general officers that are there, and then they're jumping these hurdles, you know, with the horses, beautiful girls, you know, they, I guess they're all Hollywood stars. And I says, my God, I says, this is true punishment? I can't believe it. This is entertainment. <laughs> he took us to a nice restaurant. We ate. <laughs> then we had KP in the kitchen. We were eating good over there, too, with the cook. <laughs> I says, this ain't. You know, this is nice, you know. Of course, we didn't get our our time off or anything. We worked in the kitchen or with the... Uh, Is that on the same day, the Sunday? The, yeah. The same day? No, the, no. The, the following the, Sunday. Following, yeah, oh, we so didn't, uh, the report didn't get in until oh, right. till later, see. Yeah. Then we're, uh, he called us in, you know, his office. He told Sergeant Porter, bring these six guys in, you know. <laughs> so we... We didn't realize that we were doing wrong. This no. was a time of war. He says, oh. <laughs> That's a terrific story. Yeah. Then, then, years later, Jeannie and I, Dan Daly is playing at the Chicago Theater. He played the odd couple. He was, uh, he was uh, the one that was messy all the time. And Oscar? Or? Oscar played the part of, he was the original one, you know, and uh, we went down to Chicago Theater, the wife and I, and then after the show, you know, he, the live, there was a live program on stage, and so I went in the back, they had the, you know, the security guard there, there's an older guy, and we says, would you mind telling Mr. Daly that I'd like to see him tell him that this is from the 124th Horse Cavalry and the six guys that went on the, went on the back bivouac and took the horses in the Junction City, you know? And they, they, he told him, and Davy came running out. He grabbed me. He says, geez, I was worried about you guys. You know, he never went overseas. He just took us to the train and saw us off, you know. And he says, I often thought about you guys. How, you know, you were over, went overseas. And I says, yeah, and I thought it would be nice to see you. You know, <laughs> he says, I'm so glad that you come to see me. He took us out to lunch. He says, tell me everything about Troop I, you know. That's the troop I belong to, the 124th Kelby Troop I. And I told him the things that went on over there. He says, they, because when I went to Port Riley, Kansas, he wasn't there. I saw, I said, I saw Sergeant Porter. And uh, I guess they either uh, transferred him somewhere else, but he wasn't there anymore. But he was so happy to see us. I, we sat there, ate, and drank. <laughs> and I said, a good thing. We, we got there by train, you know, by uh, the L. We took the L down there. <laughs> you didn't come on horses, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was so, so happy. But this man, Dan Daly, he had a memory. The Articles of War, he had to read them to us. All the memory, what a memory he had. He's unbelievable. But Jeannie was so happy to see him. She said, oh, you had that baby. <laughs> yeah. Well, Mr. Potashek, you have a wonderful memory. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's wonderful that you were able to come in today and uh, provide us with this memoir of uh, service and um, give uh, 
the younger generation a little a chance at uh, reading the, the transcript that will develop and um, maybe appreciating a little bit more what uh, what you and your uh, other members of the 124th Cavalry yeah. contributed to the war effort in CBI theater. And as I say, we don't have we've only got one other account from CBI, so this really helps to sort of provide a picture. Yeah. So. Yeah, we fought all over the world, you know, every the United States. Yeah. It. Uh, but this is a great country. I love this country. You know, I I got still I lost a lot of friends. I got well, thank God for Roland Kirsting. He's in Honolulu. He's still alive with a nice family and everything. We keep in contact. I got friends uh, well in New York. Uh, that was uh, Keyhart, Paul Keyhart. Thank God he's still alive. We keep in contact. Uh, and, uh, they're all over the United States and even from my old school, J school, from five years old when we were in kindergarten. We still keep in contact with each other. We're all the same age, 84 years old. Yeah. And we still call each other, you know, or write a letter. I like to call, you know, uh, California, Florida. Well, they're scattered all over, Wisconsin. Yeah. So I keep in, I try to keep in contact with everybody. And then when it comes to Christmas, I send out 160 Christmas cards to all friends, relatives. <laughs> so I keep in contact. And that's business for the post office. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, I just like, I, I love people, you know. I love mingling with people. I, irregardless, young, old, I like to keep in contact. Yeah. Because uh, I says I, I got more friends than money, <laughs> and that's what counts. Your friends. Yeah. And uh, now uh, I'm retired. Well, I get a nice pension, you know. For they gave me credit for the army. Uh, they gave me ten. I had 43 in the, years in the post office. All my life was under the federal government. And I, I get a good health insurance, you know. I can go to the VA hospital. Uh, all my wife's surgery, she had. I keep a record. It was seven hundred uh, thousand dollars, almost a million dollars, in medical bills for her, and it was all paid by the insurance, federal government. Well, I pay, let's see, now I pay a hundred for the uh, federal pension. Uh, federal insurance is a hundred and forty dollars. Uh, Medicare, I, I got my wife's Medicare because I didn't work under, I didn't have the quarters for Social, Social Security. Security. So when she passed away, they says, I get her Medicare card. So survivor, I yeah. Survivors. So I'm under her Social Security. So when I submit a bill to the doctors, the first Medicare picks it up. Then the government insurance pays the balance. Yeah. So I had a little problem with my feet. You know, I went to the foot doctor. They paid 100%. I had arteries over here on the left side and the right side. I went to the hospital. My doc doctor says, I need surgery. So they gave me a specialist. He says, uh, if I don't have this taken care of and it goes to the brain, I could have a stroke, yeah. you know, and lose your memory. So I went there, and that, and that bill was around forty-three thousand. 
and then Medicare and the other insurance picked it up. I didn't pay one penny. I says, I don't know. I'm very lucky, fortunate, that I got, they got this insurance. Otherwise, there goes the house. You know, they, they put a lien against your house if you don't pay the bills. Because I see so many of my friends, you know, they didn't have no insurance. And they lose. They, 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 they put a lien against the house. Yeah. So what's, I don't know, uh, I don't feel sorry. Uh, you know, you work all your life and then they have it all taken away from you. So I feel sorry. I don't, I don't, I don't like a lot of times I think maybe would be a good idea to have universal health care, you know, because it, it's a hardship for work. I was fortunate in a way yes. that I got into the post office and then they, they provide for you. They have good insurance, but what about these other people? They work somewhere 25 years for a company and then they go bankrupt. Oh, hi. There's a lady here to see you, is there? Oh, yeah. is this yeah, your that's daughter? Your, that's, that's my niece. Your niece? Yeah. Come on, Joshua. I got you. Yeah, that's your yeah. Shot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she just arrived. Yes, her name is Josephine. She's Joseph the one that here. made up all these pictures. Yeah. Me. We, That's um, my uh, my sister's niece. I just think like Hi, Neil. Nice yeah. 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 yeah, I was just wondering if, if it's possible um, whether we could maybe get the original of I some of these. Got, he's got the he's original. Got because, uh, we could make a date and I can bring the original then. Yeah, because I'd like to, the, the, we, we can, we'll scan those mm -hmm. and then when we type up the interview, then we give Mr. Pottercheck a yeah. booklet. And then but at the back of it, it's nice to have pictures to explain the, the story. Yeah. And uh, I did scan something, but I think the pictures would work, would, some of them would really help. Yeah, I'll bring them in any time you want. Is that the date? Well, I'll give, I, you'll have to give me a little time. Yeah, um, okay. I, I, I'll, it'll take oh, a couple weeks to get call, call I'm going to call you. I'm gonna call, you're not going on vacation anytime no, soon or anything, no. no. <laughs> and, uh, call me, and I'll have the original pictures. Good. See, because I scanned them on my, That's on my, do, on yeah. my uh, computer, yeah. and then I just put it on there, and then I says, well, you know what, I got them. I said, well, print them out and everything. So. Yeah. So we'll, we'll bring it. Yeah. 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 But you'll just call. I will. Uh, and thank you very much for a wonderful interview. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>